Great. Well, good morning, all, and thank you so much for joining us today for Hell, a virtual tour with Greg Williams. Historical lecturer Greg Williams will take you on a virtual tour of Hell, explore the early Middle Eastern and ancient Egyptian notions of the underworld, the medieval hell myth, and many of the artists who have created our favorite renditions of Hell, including Dante, Van Eyck, Bosch, Sig Signorelli, Milton, John Martin, Dore, and more. Uh, Williams was a district court judge for many years, retiring as the first justice of the Edgartown District Court uh, uh, down on the Cape in 2015. And uh, I wanna thank uh, the friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring this morning's program. And I, and I want to acknowledge the, um, the PR help uh, the promotion help from the following libraries, Boxford, Clinton, Dracut, Lowell, Newberry, and Norwood. So we thank those six libraries as well. So uh, everyone who's here watching live and those that will watch uh, on demand later on, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Greg for joining us here this morning. And Greg, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks to uh, Robert Hayes and the Tewksbury Public Library for inviting me to present this uh, look at hell with you here this morning. So welcome to the program. Welcome to hell. Uh, everybody pretty much knows what hell is, uh, at least in the abstract. And most people can distinguish hell from heaven. I submit it was the late 20th century theologian and bass player for The Who, John Entwistle, who expressed that difference most succinctly with these lyrics and observations. On top of the sky is a place where you go if you've done nothing wrong, if you've done nothing wrong. And down in the ground is a place where you go if you've been a bad boy, if you've been a bad boy. So far, solid synopsis of Western, at least Christian, uh, concept of the afterlife. But then Entwistle wanders astray a little bit with the declaration, down in the ground, you grow horns and a tail and carry a fork and burn away. Wrong. When you are sent to hell, you don't get horns, you don't get a tail, and you definitely don't get to carry a fork or any other kind of weapon, or even eating utensil. And if you're cast into flames, you might burn away, but if you do, you will be doing that over and over and over and over again, forever. Once you are in hell, you are there forever, eternally, endlessly, everlastingly, a long time. Now, before we get to the real lurid fun of hell, uh, the landscapes, the tormentors, the afflicted, has uh, described, and especially the late Middle Ages, we must consider the uh, idea of the underworld itself. Uh, hell. Hell is a huge place, clearly, with a lengthy history. So we can look at only a couple of highlights about hell. Uh, that means to the disappointment of many of you, I'm afraid that we'll probably have to save for a later separate discussion such popular topics as Zoroastrianism and maybe even Swedenborgianism. Now, as far as we know, there was a time when people didn't concern themselves much uh, about what has come to be called the afterlife. But by some point in the long history of the Sumerians, say 6,500 to 1940 uh, BCE, before the Christian era, uh, remember Pazuzu from the Exorcist. We find the land below, the kingdom of the dead, the world of no return, where everyone ended up without their being divided into good or bad, uh, virtuous or impious or any other way. It was unpleasant for everyone. It was dusty. It was dirty. Various vermin crawled all over you, eating your flesh. Uh, so essentially, it was camping. Now, the self-designated good people lamented that that's not fair. We should end up 
we good folks, we should end up in a more pleasant place, maybe a kind of paradise. So in order to choose, though, worthy people for the underworld, obviously decisions have to be made. A judge of some kind must weigh the soul or something to determine the worthiness of each person. So let's move to ancient Egypt. By the time of the Middle Kingdom in ancient Egypt, say 2055 to 1650 before the Christian era, each person's soul or heart, and uh, in ancient Egypt, that's a multifaceted concept of like everything else. So here it's grossly over, overly simpl simplified. Uh, your soul, your heart, whatever it is, is weighed to determine your final destination. So there's a trial for the fate of your soul. And at that trial, you have the chance to argue your worthiness. And you can take as much time as you want in doing that. But really, it's an empty exercise because ultimately, your heart is going to be weighed on a scale by Anubis. Anubis is a psychopomp. A psychopomp is someone or something who guides your fresh soul from earth to the afterlife. He is a god with the head of a jackal. You can see him there uh, in a couple of manifestations. And uh, he has already escorted you to this place. He has escorted you on a ferry through seven gates, et cetera, and from all those transitional states here to the Hall of Justice, to stand before the judge, the king, the god of the dead, Osiris. So your soul is on one tray of this scale, and on the other tray is a feather from the headdress of Mat, who is the goddess of truth kindness and justice. If that feather outweighs your heart, you're on your way to the field of rushes in your new body. But that's not the finish line. You go on from there, protected, we hope, by spells from the Book of the Dead. You are protected from various uh, aggressive reptiles, immense also aggressive beetles, uh, being forced to eat feces, uh, all those kinds of hazing experiences as part of your quest for immortality. But if your sin-laden heart sinks below the feather, there is Amit. Amit is a female demon who waits by the scales. You can see her there. She has the head of a crocodile, the body of a lion, and the flanks of a hippopotamus. She's aggressive. She does not hesitate to wolf down your heart. And if she does that, you are gone. You have died a second time. You are restless and you will be restlessly wandering forever. Where is unclear? Probably camping in Sumeria. Now remember, Anubis guided you on a ferry ride through seven gates. In considering the underworld in most traditions, Eastern or Western, uh, one or more of those kinds of elements appear. Uh, mountains hindering the entry to the underworld. Uh, there's a river. Uh, there's a boat with a psychopomp boat steerer. There's a bridge. There are gates with guardians. Sometimes there is a tree of significance. So watch for those elements as we go through various iterations of hell. Now, from ancient Egypt, we'll move on to classical uh, Greece and later Rome, where the judgment elements fade away, at least for a while. Uh, Hades, everybody knows that word, Hades. Hades was a god and also a gloomy realm populated by the shades of the dead. They were prevented from escaping that place by a vigilant three-headed dog called Cerberus. We will meet Cerberus again later. Uh, but then as time went on in those cultures, there crept back the notion of some kind of weighing. 
uh, punishments were meted out to many of the shades by the time of the epic, the Aeneid, written roughly 29 to 19 BCE by the poet Virgil, who we will also meet again. Uh, now though, let's skip ahead to the third century when someone who was not the apostle Paul, despite his name being on the title page, wrote the Apocalypse of Paul. Uh, this uh, uh, telling became the most popular description of hell and its tortures in medieval Europe. Uh, the point is clear. If you're a bad boy, if you're a bad girl, uh, you will be suffering everlasting torment. Uh, in his vision, Paul is guided by an angel through heaven and through hell. We're going to skip heaven, of course, and go right to hell. And the first thing that Paul sees in hell is a river of fire in which some of the condemned are submerged to their knees. Some are submerged uh, to their navels. That's got to sting a little bit. Some to their lips, uh, some to their hair. Now, this is our first mention of fiery hell. Where did that theme start? Maybe it is a literal understanding of the lake of fire referred to in the book of Revelation. The angel in Paul's tour of hell explains the system of determining your uh, fire level ranking. Then Paul sees a huge pit into which the fire river flows. It is a pit filled with groaning, agonized souls smashed on top of each other. They are jammed in there tightly, uh, the very opposite of social distancing. And Paul figures there must be 30 or 40 generations worth of people in there. And he uh, wonders to the angel whether the pits will eventually fill up with those agonized souls. The angel says, in essence, uh, don't worry about that. This abyss has no end. So in essence, these souls will be pressed tightly up against each other forever. As the 20th century existentialist philosopher Sartre will observe, hell is other people. Hell can also be, at least the access to hell, a massive monster with a gaping maw. And that open mouth serves as a portal to hell. Here are some people having dinner in hell, or at least a hell mouth. Uh, the road to hell might be paved with good intentions, but at the front door, there are large fangs, a revolting tongue, halitosis beyond imagining, and that's before we even get down the throat. Another hell mouth with uh, people being delivered there too. Uh, this idea appears unsurprisingly in the Bible, specifically the Old Testament, and more specifically, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 14. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. So there you go. This uh, maybe this, this kind of looks like a dog or a puppy of some kind. Maybe it's Cerberus. The hell mouth apparently began appearing in Anglo-Saxon art uh, right around the beginning of the ninth century. And it was popular throughout the Middle Ages in the visual arts and also in theater. Now, you've probably heard of me uh, medieval mystery plays, my mystery plays themselves. Uh, these are not whodunits. Uh, mystery here derives from the word miracle. And in these mystery plays, when they were presented to the townsfolk, uh, heaven would be depicted on one side of the stage and hell on the other side of the stage. There's a hell mouth stage. Uh, the hell mouth would be constructed over a trap door in the stage. And there would be actors down there dressed probably in leather costumes. 
and they would ascend uh, from below the stage through the trap door into the hell mouth head. And when the mechanical jointed mouth opened, those demons would erupt out onto the stage. Audiences loved it. There's a somewhat modern hell mouth from the 1960s. So when these demons came flying out of this hell mouth, uh, they probably scared the audience right out of their jerkins, but they loved it. And once all those demons started dancing around the stage and snatching up souls, stage hands would ignite fireworks out of the hell mouth. And so they would fill the fun side of the stage with smoke. Audiences loved it. And then some productions then additionally featured sulfurous or a pitch smell emitting from the hell mouth. Superb special effects. Now, the enduring source of many of the notions about hell for the last seven centuries is the work of the poet Dante Alighieri. Dante is, as you already know, one of the most important figures in Western literature. Dante was born about 1265 in the Republic of Florence. Uh, he, like most Florentines, became embroiled in various political and religious conflicts. Uh, and at one point he was away at Rome and the faction for the moment controlling Florence convicted him in absentia for some financial crimes and they heavily fined him. But Dante couldn't or wouldn't pay those fines. So he was deemed exiled, never to return to Florence. Not long after uh, having completed his masterwork, The Divine Comedy, Dante died uh, aged about 56 in Ravenna in 1321, possibly of malaria, and he was buried there in Ravenna. Uh, Florence eventually regretted having exiled Dante from Florence, and they wanted his body back so that his remains could be buried there in Florence. Uh, Ravenna uh, thought about it for about half a second and said, nope. We're keeping Dante here. There is, though, a tomb for Dante in the Basilica Santa Croce in Florence, and it's just steps away from a great pizza gelato place called Finisterre. And I have the gelato scoop from Finisterre. It was so good, I kept a little scoop here. Um, but anyway, going back to the tomb, uh, Dante's tomb in uh, that basilica is obviously empty since his body is in Ravenna. There are also tombs there for Michelangelo, Galileo, and Machiavelli though, and they're filled. So the municipality of Florence would like to actually place Dante in the empty tomb that's been waiting for him. Uh, and toward that end, they officially apologized for Dante's having been exiled in 2008. Now, speaking of the 21st century, this year is the 700th anniversary of Dante's death. Going to his epic work, The Divine Comedy. The first part of The Divine Comedy is the Inferno, Hell. Uh, the other two parts are Purgatorio, um, which I'm able to translate from the Italian. It means purgatory. Uh, and Paradiso, which I'm also able to translate, it means paradise or heaven. We will, of course, stick strictly to hell. The Inferno begins with a woman named Beatrice calling for an angel to summon the Roman poet Virgil, whom we met earlier, the author of the Aeneid, to guide Dante through hell safely. Now, Beatrice, by the way, uh, was inspired by an actual person, sort of, named Beatrice de Falco Portinari, uh, whom Dante sort of knew, kind of in a way. He first met her when they were both nine years old. 
Uh, you'll recall that in the 1959 Isley Brothers song, Shout, part one, Ronald Isley sings the lyrics, I still remember when you used to be nine years old, I was a fool for you from the bottom of my soul. And that lyric perfectly captures the history of Dante's feelings about Beatrice. Uh, even though Dante probably only spoke to Beatrice a few times, he developed for her a kind of idealistic courtly love, a concept that, uh, never mind, let's move on to hell. Dante created the tale landscape of hell, and most people know it, it consists of nine circles. The circles are broken down into further subdivisions, some 24 in all. We obviously won't visit all of them. The circles are concentric. They grow smaller. Uh, their inhabitants grow more wicked as we descend. So hell, in Dante's vision, uh, is sometimes thought of and artistically rendered as a kind of uh, funnel heading down to its termination at the center of the earth. Uh, this is a depiction of that by Botticelli, uh, Sandro Botticelli, not his real name, uh, painted hell in cross section. And here's a close up. Uh, this is great, but it is difficult to picture the vastness of hell when we think uh, funnel. It's helpful to picture it more like this, a descending series of circular stepped planes. And you see it there, limbo, lust, gluttony, all anger, sullenness, all of that. We'll get to some of those places. Now it was not the Italian Renaissance painter Botticelli, but a French engraver of the 19th century called Gustave Doré, who is most identified with pictorially rendering Dante's divine comedy, especially the Inferno. Uh, just mentioning Doré provides an excuse for showing a grave, which we take at every opportunity. He is buried in the famous Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. There is his grave, Gustave Doré. And we will now move from Paris to hell proper. Let's pick a few circles, see who's home. To reach the first circle, Dante and Virgil and we readers have to pass through the gate of hell on which is carved a poem, the famous last line of which is, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. There you see uh, Dante and Virgil. Uh, the poets, uh, the two poets there enter a sort of ante room or foyer to hell this contains the shades of the uncommitted. Uh, these are people who took no position on anything during their lives, but their own interests. These uncommitted run around in a mist pursued by hornets. Uh, blood, pus, and tears run down their bodies, and uh, they, their feet are continually continuously con, uh, consumed by uh, maggots and worms. Uh, pretty bad. Plus, we aren't even really in hell yet. So it's time to jump into the boat. The ferryman is uh, Karen. Uh, like, Anubis, uh, like Anubis, rather, Karen is a psychopomp. Uh, this picture is by a Flemish artist who painted in Italy, uh, called Stradanus. Uh, the close-up uh, is from Michelangelo's Last Judgment, more about that concept soon, that covers the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, we cross the river Acheron and arrive in actual hell, the first circle, which doesn't seem so bad. At least there aren't any hornets it's the edge of hell, limbo, from the Latin limbus, meaning hem or border. Limbo is populated by pre-Christian peoples. And you could easily be starstruck here to see such virtuous pagans as Adam, Homer, 
Socrates, Julius Caesar. This is where Virgil lives, he being pre-Christian, uh, when he's not offering tours. These Limboites, Limbonians, whatever you want to call them, uh, live in a castle with seven gates. Remember that from ancient Egypt, symbolizing seven virtues, which I will not uh, insult you by naming. What these Limboites do throughout eternity is somewhat unclear, uh, but they're not physically tortured. They're not physically harmed. Could you plug this in? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Oh, uh, physical torture, uh, physical being, physical harm, we will get to that. And here, presumably crawling all over the castle, are unbaptized infants. Now, if you know the, the uh, apocryphal con concept of the harrowing of hell, this is where that happened. After his crucifixion, Jesus entered uh, this portion of hell and uh, snatched from it his, quote, ancestors, the patriarchs from the Hebrew Bible, in order to deliver them to heaven. Now, when we enter the second circle, matters become a little more hellish. Uh, still aren't any bees, thankfully, but we meet Minos. Is that it? No. Sorry, I need a cord. It's in the case. Uh, if we could just hold for just a second while I get some power here. No problem, Greg. Uh, beg your pardon. Uh, this is always something goes wrong, and let's hope this is it this time around. There you go. Oh, yeah. Minos, Minos. This is one of those names you, you can't. Uh, mispronounce really because everybody pronounces it somewhat differently uh, and here he is uh, this gentleman judges sinners entering hell and he assigns them to their circle and he signals that information to them by wrapping his uh, serpentine tail around himself the number of times to indicate the circle where you will be staying four times, straight to circle four, which is greed. Uh, eight times, you are going to fraud land. Now, with that second circle, we begin the seven capital sins, starting with a good one, lust. Here are such carnal sinners who have subordinated their reason to their desire, such people as Cleopatra. Now, why didn't she get into limbo? Uh, apparently, she did a little too much reason subordinating. Uh, Sir Lancelot is there. Now, about Cleopatra for a second, one of her lovers, famously, was Julius Caesar, who we noticed previously is relatively comfortable in limbo. Uh, can, and the question arises, can Cleopatra at least see him from where she is? Uh, probably not since uh, she and the lustful inhabitants here constantly are whirled around in howling stormy winds forever, which also presumably prevents at least some of them from, you know, meeting each other, getting together. It's an unpleasant punishment, but it is the least of those meted out in hell. Let's move on where matters become a little nastier. Since uh, Thanksgiving will be in a couple of months, we should stop off at the third circle. Here, gluttons are guided by Cerberus, the three-headed dog we met earlier, uh, or as Dante also describes him, that huge worm. Here is Doré's Cerberus. Now, however vigilant Cerberus is, however vicious Cerberus is, he apparently can be distracted by treats. Uh, actually, this is mud that's being thrown uh, by Virgil. In this circle, there is eternal cold rain, hail, and snow falling on the reeking ground on which uh, gluttons howl like dogs and roll around. Uh, Cerberus, of course, is constantly barking. And if you, any of you with neighbors uh, know what that's like, um, but he does more than guard them quote from Dante in English, with his taloned hand, hands, he claws the spirits 
flays and quarters them. Uh, in short, he rips them apart over and over again. Uh, and he or they, however you want to uh, denominate Cerberus, uh, looks sufficiently crazed in this rendering by uh, William Blake. Okay, let's skip uh, over four, which as I just mentioned is greed, and let's get to uh, circle five, wrath, where the slimy filth element introduced in the third circle is cranked up a lot. Here is the quote swamp called Styx. Back to Doré. The ferryman here is Phlegius. This is black filth filled with angry and wrathful souls. They are naked, they are smeared with mud, they pummel each other with their fists, they headbutt each other, kick each other, uh, and rip each other with their teeth. Here is a uh, rendering of that by uh, the 19th century painter Delacroix. In this painting, one wrathful guy there on the, on the uh, left even chews on the boat. The water of the sticks is kept bubbling and roiling by the sighs emitted by the uh, sullen sinners who are trapped in the black mire, which is at the bottom of the sticks. Now, so far we've visited upper hell where the sins are mostly those of weakness or self-indulgence. Uh, we, uh, Dante uh, leaves the fifth circuit, uh, circle in a small skiff and he sees in the distance high towers resembling mosques that glow red because an eternal fire burns within them. This is the city of Dis. DIS, uh, surrounded by iron walls and guarded by more than 1,000 fallen angels and furies and Medusa. This is uh, painted on a shield. This is a Caravaggio. Dis separates upper hell from lower hell. Lower hell is where sinners uh, go who are guilty of malicious acts carried out with ill will. Uh, maybe you want to think of it as specific criminal intent. Uh, Virgil tries and fails to gain entry here. So luckily, an angel arrives and opens the gate with a touch of a wand. Uh, normally, you don't think of angels wielding wands, but uh, anyway, they get past the wall and they are in the sixth circle of hell. And Dante sees their heretics burning in fiery tombs, at least smoking tombs. And then the two poets, Dante and Virgil, have to dodge the Minotaur. Uh, have to say the Minotaur does not look that threatening in this rendering. Uh, in fact, I believe this pose was adopted for the film Titanic. Uh, I want you to draw me like one of your French girls. At this point, the two poets are about to clamber down a bank formed by boulders, and they perceive an unbearable foul stench belched from that bottomless abyss, unquote. The seventh circle is for violent sinners. And the first ring is for murderers or tyrants. And they are bobbing in the phlegathon, which is a river of boiling blood. Anybody who bobs up out of that fluid higher than they are allowed to are quickly shot by arrows from centaurs who constantly ride well, not really ride because they're their own steeds, uh, run around the, uh, the river with their bows drawn, ready to fire. The second ring is for people who have died by suicide or who have attempted it. And these people, these souls have been transmogrified into gnarled, contorted thorn trees. 
and harpies who are hideous giant birds of prey with human faces uh, feed on their leaves. Uh, we'll skip the rest of this circle and uh, the eighth circle, which is fraud and et cetera, et cetera, to take a quick look at the final circle, the ninth, uh, for those who have committed various kinds of treachery. Uh, here is not fire, but ice and freezing wind. Sinners are trapped in ice with variations. Some have only their heads above the ice and they cannot move them. Others can uh, bow their heads for some relief from the wind. Uh, not sure that pulling their hair helps any. Uh, others are supine in the ice and their tears freeze into a kind of crystal. The last group is completely frozen within ice in, a con in contorted positions. Then the two poets reach the center of hell. Uh, the devil, once uh, the angel, Lucifer, now Satan, is here. He has committed personal treachery against God. Virgil calls him Dis, uh, the Roman god of the underworld. You can see these names sometimes or a, or a, a being and also a place. Uh, Dis, Satan, the devil, is an immense giant covered with coarse hair, and he himself is trapped in the ice to his waist. He retains the six wings that he had when he was among the seraphim, but now they're bat's wings. And though he beats his wings, uh, thereby generating the freezing winds that whip through lower hell, he's going nowhere. Uh, not pictured here, but he has three phases, a kind of whitish yellow one, a red one, and a black one. Quote, out of his six eyes, he wept, and his three, his three chins dripped tears and drooled blood-red saliva. Each of his mouths is shredding forever a traitor. On the left and right, Brutus and Cassius for engineering the assassination of Julius Caesar, uh, who's back in limbo and they definitely can't see him. In the central mouth uh, is Judas Iscariot. Judas is stuck in Lucifer's mouth uh, head first. Uh, Lucifer doesn't just gnaw on Judas, he also rips Judas, Judas's back with claws forever. Uh, and then it's time for Dante and Virgil to leave hell. And they start back by shimmying down Lucifer's hairy flank, uh, which I have to say doesn't do much for his all-encompassing evil reputation. They end up in a narrow ravine that leads them back up to the surface of earth. They arrive there on Easter morning to look up at the dawn stars. Now from Dante, again, remember he died 1321, we move forward north from the republics, kingdoms and states that would eventually become Italy uh, more than a century to the Netherlands. First for a brief look at half of a small painting by Jan van Eyck, who is uh, most famous painting probably is the Arnolfini portrait, might be familiar with. Now the bottom half of that right panel, which is one of the two panels in a diptych, two paintings hinged together, that panel is the last judgment painted uh, 1440s. Uh, the last judgment, clearly a popular subject for artists from the middle ages onward. It's a great chance to paint some souls being tortured. Keep in mind the traditional Christian belief that there are two judgments uh, oversimplified. I think of them as when you, die, when you die, you are judged in what is called particular judgment. You're assigned to hell or heaven or maybe purgatory, which itself falls in and out of favor. But beyond that judgment, 
is the last or general judgment. This is the second coming of Jesus, resurrection all around. Then you're judged again. And this is where it gets really confusing, at least to me, because as I understand it, once you're in hell, you're there forever, eternally, everlastingly. It's complicated. Uh, let's get back to the painting. Now that whole right panel of Von Eich's work um, is just a little bit over 22 inches by seven inches. So this part alone, is tiny, it's half of that, tiny painting. But Van Eyck packed plenty in here, uh, excreted from the bowels of that marvelous winged skeleton you see at the top, death, obviously, let's take a close look. Um, he is excreting into hell, a writhing mass of doomed souls, uh, including uh, royal figures, including clerical figures, and they're being disemboweled and devoured by various devils in the shape of rats, serpents, uh, skull-headed jaguars, other snarling nasties. A little less crowded, but uh, more conventional demonic torturers and tormentors is Derek Bouts's Hell, painted in 1450. I say conventional, one of them has eyes for nipples. So, you know, that's conventional, I guess. Anyway, this is uh, Derek Bouts's work of 1450. Now, as great as those paintings are, and they are, uh, the year Bouts created his hell, a baby named Yaruin or Euronymous Anton Zanun von Aachen was born into a family of artists about 1450 in Sertogenbas, in North Brabant, uh, Holland. He would later name himself after his town. He would become known as the maker of devils, Hieronymus Bosch. Uh, for years, art critics pictured Bosch as sort of secreted away, uh, creating his intricate dream worlds. Uh, they debated whether he was a devil worshiper, whether he was mentally ill, or whether he was intoxicated on some kind of 15th century uh, hallucinogen. But increasingly, he is seen as none of those things. He is deeply religious. He is a member in a kind of clerical-oriented fraternity called the Brotherhood of Our Blessed Lady. Uh, for Bosch, humanity is constantly caught in a war, diabolical foe versus God. It is that eternal struggle that constitutes the real reality. And in the words of uh, one of his most astute critics, he excelled in nefarious phantasms, diabolical deceptions, and the grotesque machinery of damnation. At the same time, even given his profoundly Christian uh, grounding displayed in his works, uh, he's seen as a precursor to surrealism. His fiendish hybrid creatures are unnatural. They exist counter to God's order, the order that God has created. Some of them are even part machine. Uh, they populate most of his works, uh, sometimes seemingly over, uh, almost to overflowing. But the figures in Bosch's scenes of hell are not generally massed or crowded in the way that, say, uh, Von Eich's and Bautz's were. Uh, plus, more importantly, Bosch's hellish tormenting devils, his demons, are different from those that we've considered so far. The works now considered to be genuine Bosch's are few maybe 25 paintings, some drawings. Uh, Bosch portrayed hell in several works, notably in his most famous one uh, called since the 19th century, The Garden of Earthly Delights, also in his work, The Last Judgment. These two works are intact triptychs. There are three panels, uh, oil painting on wood, 
They are hinged together, often used as an altarpiece. This is uh, the garden of earthly delights with the panels closed. Uh, triptychs were often kept closed and the outside shutters of them, as you see here, uh, at least in Bosch's world, are usually painted in grise, mono, monochromatic uh, grays that kind of evoke sculpture. And they would them thematically relate to the three paintings inside. Uh, those paintings inside uh, would be brighter. I say brighter. Uh, with Bosch, they are all but day glow. Bosch's reputation did not remain local. Among his customers was the King of Spain, Philip II, which is why this masterwork is uh, in Spain, in Madrid, in the Prado Museum. The Prado does not lend out this work ever. The Garden of Earthly Delights, and remember, he didn't call it that, it's only been called that since the 19th century, was painted about 1503. Uh, everyone has seen a reproduction or a poster of it. Uh, many people probably owned an ornately framed poster of this painting when they were a student in Virginia in the 1970s. Broadly speaking, the left panel depicts the sixth day of creation. You see Adam and Eve there. On the large central pane or panel is sort of a, an elaborate frat party, uh, probably really more like humankind in a bogus paradise characterized by unbridled lust. And on the right panel, hell. Probably the two most well-known figures in Bosch's hell are the tree man and the blue bird headed demon. Uh, the tree man, that face might be a self-portrait of Bosch. Uh, the tree man presents his posterior to the viewer and he houses in his egg shaped body, a tavern. Uh, you see there three guys are at a table. Uh, they are seated on a toad. They are threatened by flames. This is a depiction of a, a trope much written about in Bosch's Netherlands called the evil inn. It signifies uh, brothels, low down bars offering alcohol, gambling, sex, and secular music. Sins of lust, wrath, vanity, avarice. Here is the bluebird I referred to. You will note in the upper left, some sinful secular musical instruments. Uh, this bluebird of evil is ensconced on some kind of a throne slash toilet. He is swallowing a sinner who is already experiencing some digestive issues of his own. Uh, from his rectum, he is expelling birds, smoke, and fire. Uh, the cauldron on the demon's head signifies his uh, endless appetite, gluttony. And he is excreting sinners in a kind of blue bubble. Uh, we can guess that they'll be uh, undergoing this ordeal uh, forever. Now, to emphasize how transformative Bosch's hell is, let's take a quick look at two of his contemporaries. During Bosch's young adulthood, there was another Flemish painter called Hans Memling, who painted in Bruges, now part of Belgium. Uh, this is a, a hell panel from Memling's Last Judgment. Uh, everybody looks duly upset here. Uh, the demons look duly unpleasant. And there's fire. Uh, nothing unexpected here. It's great stuff, but pretty conventional. An exactly contemporary with Bosch's Last Judgment 
an artist called Luca Signorelli painted a fresco, which is in the Orvieto Cathedral, the beautiful town of Orvieto. It uh, sits a, uh, dramatically on the top of a butte in Umbria, about an hour north of Rome. Uh, my family visited Orvieto Cathedral a few years ago, uh, but to my shame, I did not know about this fresco, which is generally called the damned being cast into hell. So I didn't see it, despite being in the building where it is housed, and despite the fact that it is 23 feet long. Didn't see it. Still, here we have impressive humanoid demons of various hues, uh, gathering souls just arrived in hell, uh, torturing them, but not elaborately. They're biting ears, they're twisting toes and, and the like, standing on people's heads, that kind of thing. Signorelli does not give us much in the way of topography, but he concentrates on the figures, including himself. Uh, he is the blue one there in the center, uh, endearing himself to this young lady. Uh, that is accepted as Signorelli's self-portrait. Let's jump back uh, from what became Italy to what became Holland and back to Bosch's Last Judgment, uh, painted about 1506, another triptych. Hell here starts in the central panel. The top of the panel depicts Jesus separating souls. You have to look pretty closely at this to see saved souls being escorted up to heaven. Many are called, but few are chosen. And the vast majority of the people are depicted in the bottom three quarters of the panel. Let's closer to look. This is a parched, dirty brown wasteland in which the damned are herded uh, and tortured by uh, wonderful, in, in the broad sense of that word, demons. And there is a bridge in the near foreground of the central panel is that bridge to hereafter, across which bridge approaches a crowd of demons and lost souls. Uh, farther up, there is a pair of devils banging horseshoes onto souls. Get it? Souls, souls. And there are other people being obviously burnt up. Uh, note though, that not everyone in Bosch's paintings is being actively tortured. What the sins of these souls being shod are is unclear, but there is little doubt that several gluttons are being made into meals are being forced to eat or drink. Uh, here we see a glutton and there is little doubt what that glutton is being force fed. Uh, somebody's uh, excretings coming out of that uh, barred window up there. Now in the hell panel of, last, of the last judgment in a structure near the bottom, a little hard to see, uh, we find some figure that some scholars have identified as Satan, however less imposing he is than the one that uh, Dante described and even the one that Doré uh, engraved. Uh, at least uh, the, those looked imposing, even uh, if the Doré one, the Dante one, was unaware of people climbing down his flanks. This Satan is uh, a judge in a portal and the portal itself is surrounded by a frieze of toads. Uh, we talked about a toad earlier who served as a table in the, uh, in the evil inn in the Eggman. And uh, the toads in, the, in Bosch's world are emblematic of envy, gluttony, and lust, which is a lot. Uh, and they're demonic, really, just like owls are in his world. Behind Satan in the darkness, don't know if you can see that, but there are souls jammed together, perhaps awaiting transport. Satan is about to pronounce sentence on two nude figures. Uh, 
these obviously echo Adam and Eve. This is the punishment phase of the trial that they have already lost. There is a spectacled prosecuting demon. You see him there with the sort of red hat on over the male figure. He is reading out their crimes. It should be obvious, obviously, that you can, should be obvious, obviously, that you can study even reproductions of Bosch's works for a long time and apprehend all kinds of meanings. But we should move on a couple of centuries. Uh, in the 17th century came John Milton. His Paradise Lost, uh, which we obviously have to mention because one, this blank verse epic poem is one of the keystones of English literature. Two, uh, in that work, Milton invented the word pandemonium, uh, which in essence means all demons, signifying the capital city of hell. And three, that poem has been illustrated by numerous artists like the Divine Comedy, including Doré and William Blake, but also by John Martin. Part of uh, Paradise Lost concerns Lucifer's fall from heaven, heaven with his rebel angels uh, and his being banished to hell, where he becomes Satan and proceeds to organize his followers there and redecorate the place. In the paintings and engravings of uh, John Martin, English romantic art, artist, 1789, 1854, uh, he specializes in small figures in vast tumultuous landscapes. And in this one, we can see pandemonium uh, and also inside those halls of damnation, which we'll get to in a moment. This is a large oil called pandemonium painted in 1841. It is 72 by 48 inches. We see the walls of the, capitals of of the capital of hell and it, they look suspiciously like parliament in London if the Thames were on fire. This is kind of unsettling since John Martin's brother, Jonathan, was a notorious arsonist uh, who nearly burnt down the splendid uh, cathedral called York Minster and who, while he was in an asylum, drew an apocalyptic picture of the destruction of London. Anyway, that's Satan standing out there, uh, not trapped in ice, but posing like a statue of a classical warrior almost. Martin created a series of 48 mezzotint engravings, uh, essentially page size, 11 by eight, for a new edition of Paradise Lost. And the most well-known is uh, called uh, Satan Presiding at the Infernal Council. Here is Satan, he is enthroned among his uh, fallen angels of the Stygian Council and impressively, um, impressively uh, balanced on that sphere. Now this disquieting, also quiet scene seems a good place to wrap up. Uh, we could do that by noting that uh, although there are kinds of physical hell that we've looked at have been in, believed in by increasingly fewer people, uh, we humanity have managed, especially at several points during the 20th century to create uh, actual hells on the surface of our planet. But that might be predictable uh, and it's certainly, well, depressing. So I think it's better to return to Bosch and fade away with a few more close ups of his delightfully infernal creations. The end.
So Greg, thank you uh, so, so much for the presentation. Uh, folks, let's take at least five minutes of questions. So if you have a question for uh, Greg, uh, feel free to type it into the Q&A. Uh, Karen would like to know, how did you go from a law career to an, ex to an exhaustive research uh, into concepts of hell and history? That's uh, a good question. Uh, probably best answered by, uh, um, and I don't show it here, but uh, even back in high school, my high school graduation picture is me with my arm around a skeleton and holding a skull. So I've always had this kind of uh, attraction, I guess, to, uh, to dark things and places and people. Uh, some of which I did see during my law career. Uh, Teresa has a similar question. Um, why did you decide to research hell and how long did it take you to research for your presentation? Uh, really, really hard to, uh, to calculate how long. I mean, I read a lot. Uh, I, I reread several books uh, about hell. I knew a fair amount about some of these artists, particularly Bosch. Um, Bruegel didn't quite make it here, although he could have. And uh, it, it takes a while. It takes a, what takes the most time, as in with almost any kind of writing, I think, is synthesizing it all down. Uh, there's a lot out there, obviously, about all of these topics. And you need to try to get it down into a size that you can convey in about an hour. Uh, so I hope that sort of answers your question. I could not quantify how long it took. It was little bits and pieces uh, here and there over a long period of time, frankly. Uh, Joy says, uh, this has been very interesting. Thank you, you. from Conway, Massachusetts. Conway, uh, Western Massachusetts, right? Thank there you. We go. Uh, Karen asks, uh, do you know of any culture or religion that, that does not have a hell? That's a good question. Uh, I am certainly not a theological specialist. Uh, culture that does not have a hell. I just don't, I, I suspect some of the Eastern religions don't have hell as such, as a physical place. Um, maybe even as a state, I'm, but I'm not sure. And I really don't feel qualified to, to answer that in any meaningful way. Uh, Don wants me to ask you if, uh, after giving this presentation, uh, are you uh, afraid to die? No, I'm not afraid to die. Well, I'm afraid to die in the natural way, but I'm not afraid, let me twist the question a little bit. I'm not afraid of, that I'm going to hell uh, because I don't think anybody is. Uh, I am not a religious person. There we go. Uh, Linda in the chat says that Unitarian Universalism uh, is a religion that uh, does not have a hell. So there we go. We have at least one. Uh, okay, that's, Sean, that's, that's good. That's a good point. And I should have come up with that one since I uh, actually know, know people who are uh, pastors or ministers in that faith. Sure. Uh, Shaw says, thank you for a very interesting program. And thank you, you. to the library for hosting. Uh, you're welcome, Shaw. Teresa wants to know, and I'm kind of curious too, do you ever uh -oh. plan on writing a book about hell or maybe a book about another subject? Uh, what I've been thinking about more recently is I, I uh, do have a lot of subjects that I've talked about. I don't consider myself a historian or a specialist in any of these things. I feel that I'm more of a, a storyteller. I try to pick a theme and then tell a story. And what I've been thinking about most recently is putting together maybe uh, uh, three, maybe four of the talks into a book um, that would probably feature, uh, as I told Robert earlier, I do a talk about uh, Lemuel Shaw, who was the chief justice of the Supreme Judicial Court during the 19th century. His son-in-law was Herman Melville, uh, and there's a lot of interesting interplay there involving a married couple who are hanged in London that Melville and also Charles Dickens witnessed. Uh, Melville actually bought a broadside of that event to give to his father-in-law, Chief Justice Lemuel Shaw, who ended up trying the case that many of you may have heard of called, uh, generally called the murder at Harvard. Uh, it was a murder in the old Harvard Medical College, which is now where Mass General is, 
by a professor at Harvard Medical College of one of the Parkman family in Boston. And then it's got a lot of real grisly stuff in it. And uh, that would be one of the things that I try to put together that, uh, and a lot has been written by that, uh, including by such people as Simon Shama. So uh, I put that and maybe a couple of uh, other topics together in a book. I, I appreciate the confidence that I might be able to write a book. So thanks for that question. Uh, and Karen just wanted to say thank you. And this was thank quite you, the day, uh, quite a way to start the day. So thank you, Karen. Well, that's what I thought when, it, when Robert told me that these were in the morning, so. Well, you know, I, I thought with a subject <laughs> like this, maybe, maybe it would be better to do it at the beginning of the day rather than hear it and then go to bed in an hour or two. So maybe, maybe oh, this will work out. Um, okay. So uh, Greg, do you have any uh, last words before we wrap up? No, I just wanted to thank again. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you actually hung on for this whole thing. Uh, Robert probably has those uh, statistics, but yep. those of you who uh, signed up for this and who stayed till the uh, till the end, I really appreciate it. And again, I appreciate uh, the Tewksbury Public Library for asking me to do this, and particularly Robert Hayes of that library. Oh, you're making me blush, Greg. Well, uh, you, you'd be glad to know that almost everyone stayed on for the entire time. And uh, I wanna thank you for a wonderful presentation. And I also wanna thank our partnering libraries of Boxford, Clinton, Drake at Lowell, Newberry and Norwood for helping me uh, promote this morning's talk. Uh, so again, folks, look for that email for me later today with a link to the recording. Uh, feel free to share the recording with anyone who you feel may be interested and also uh, take 60 seconds and fill out the survey. Uh, so thank you all so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again, Greg. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Bye.